Uh, Mr. Kessler, can we get this issue aside? Are you of the opinion you can have non-willful contempt? Uh, I'm of the opinion that contempt implies that it's willful. And if you hold somebody in contempt, then it is by itself contempt. The fact that the court tried to qualify it and soften it by, by qualifying it or, or denoting it as non-willful doesn't make it reversible. It means that it was a willful action the court was trying There's to say. There's got to be contumacious conduct to be uh, contempt. Right, and I think that's why the court held her in contempt, but the court was trying to soften the blow to her, in my opinion. Yeah, but that's a legal finding. You can't soften the blow in a legal finding. Uh, I agree. I think it has to be, I think contempt is willful, and I think this right. contempt was willful, and the contempt... That's not what the court found. But the court, court found it was not willful. But in my understanding, contempt doesn't have to recite whether it's willful or not. The order simply has to say that it's contempt, which implies a willfulness. I, I agree. However, when the court says non-willful contempt, uh, that's an oxymoron. Uh, agreed. And that's, and that's not the gist of this case, and this case survives well without that. If that was overturned... The, the rest of the case could survive. But I think that she was held in contempt of that. But if I may... Address the procedural issue. Sure. I'm, glad. I'm sorry, Chief. Can I just, in the attorney's fee order, though the court only applies attorney's fees for the two counts that the court found her in willful contempt. So I'm still trying to figure out what yeah. the sanction yeah. what the sanction was for that non-willful contempt. I, I, I don't know that there was a sanction for that. And I think there was also the dismissal and the, the AV person with the court has turned the, the PowerPoint off during this uh, Coons presentation and then was going to turn it on back during mine, and I don't know if it's before your honors now. It has come up a few times. A 5635 application does constitute a supersedence, doesn't it? Doesn't authorize a supersedence. As uh, yeah. opposed to 5634, I realize it does. I, I believe it does. And Mr. Webster is going to address the procedural matters. I just wanted to bring to the court's attention some of the the factual background, some of the factual errors that were in the brief and the documents provided by um, my opponent. Um, just come off. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And, and I do want to get to, let me also address the, the therapist issue. My client's a physical doctor. He's an MD. He was awarded by agreement decision making with respect to therapy medical issues. We took the deposition of Ms. Averin's boyfriend and submitted that into evidence where it was clear she unilaterally located a therapist, took the child to a the therapist, after the fact asked my client would he agree to that therapist. He said no. She testified that he said well if you pay for it. It doesn't negate the fact that she originated the therapy sessions and to say that a guardian should be allowed to talk to a therapist that was unilaterally chosen later found to be a contemptuous violation of the court order would sort of be condoning her behavior. She's taken a child to a therapist and then wants to use that therapist as evidence in a custody dispute. It doesn't make sense. The therapist, the court correctly held her in contempt of bringing the child to a therapist without her client's permission and without her client's direction. If, if I may, the background, and also the, she mentioned the sequestration issue. My client had a significant other come to the courtroom. She was in the courtroom. That's the witness they're talking about. There was no mention of her being a witness. No one ever mentioned that she would be a witness. She came to the courtroom to watch my client's hearing, and when Ms. Kuhn asked for the rule of sequestration to be invoked, she said, what about that lady back there? The judge said, is that a witness? Ms. Ms. Kuhn responded, yes. And I said, that's the first I've heard of it. There's been no subpoena. Obviously, it was a, a way to try to get somebody not to be able to watch it. We had no notice. She'd not been subpoenaed. There'd been depositions taken. This was not a witness. This was a friend of my client. They came to watch. She came because we brought her. So they weren't they're saying, why would you need subpoenas? Well, if they wanted somebody, they could have subpoenaed her. In any event, real quickly, this is, I have about seven slides that I'd like to get uh, the gist of the case before you honor because I think there are some errors uh, in their brief and in their factual recitation. The divorce was in 2003. Three children, my client uh, and, and the mother divided the children. Three years later, the two older children elected to live with my client. They moved in with him, modification 2007. Two months later, she filed another modification. It was time for child support. She served him and then dismissed it. 2008, she filed a case, still less than one year later, mitigated, <coughs> significant discovery, psychological evaluations requested, uh, motions to dismiss. On the hearing date, and everybody was prepared for this hearing, the court entertained the motion to dismiss and dismissed the case. Now, 
Wilson, there was much less litigation before the case was dismissed. That was a voluntary withdrawal, and Mr. Webster will address that. In any event, the court dismissed the case, and then one year later, and again, this is important, not just one year later, but less than two years from the case even before that, she filed the instant case for modification. Um, I think the two-year limitation, and your honors are well aware that from a final order on your request for modification of visitation, you must wait two years. From a final order on your request for a child support modification, you must wait two years. Two years of peace is the purpose of the statute, to give Dr. Garten two years of not having to defend more litigation that's obviously gone, has gone through five cases defending it. In a nutshell, she filed that case, dismissed December 8, 2008. The final order, and the judge, this is important, specifically wrote into that order, final order. But it was clear she considered it a final order, that's with prejudice. She recited that it had been not been two years. There had been significant litigation. The case was dismissed at that point in time. Less than a year later, she files the case that we're here on. So we had that initial burden that she didn't wait the two years. And if she wants to say it goes back, well, she didn't wait two years from the one before that. Do you get to litigate, 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 get kicked out because it hasn't been two years, and then say, oh, I only had three more months to wait? I'll step back and I'll wait three more months, or do you start two years beyond that? Our position is, there was significant litigation. He defended it. The court dismissed the case. He is entitled to wait two years before there's a modification on visitation or on child support. Mr. Kessler, can we sit down some questions? Would you answer, address those specifically as to whether or not the denial of a motion to set aside an award of attorney's fees is directly appealable? Mr. If I may, Mr. Webster wants to address that at the conclusion. Okay. If I may, I just, being the trouble, I want to just bring the court these last three, two slides. The court dismissed the mother's case because of the two-year limitation. The court cited the statutes that, that had the two-year limitations. The court also dismissed the mother's case because there's no material change in circumstance. Ms. Kuhn said that there was no evidence of that. Her client testified in that hearing because I cross-examined her. And I asked what was the change of circumstance, and the transcript will bear out. She said the child's unhappy. That was the mother's answer. The guardian ad litem testified before the case was dismissed on that issue. So the court did hear testimony about whether there was a change. There was no even prima facie showing of what the change of circumstance would be. But in case that was not enough, 19924, which your honors are well aware, precludes the following of a change of custody or change of visitation rights when you are wrongfully withholding custody rights. That doesn't mean somebody has to be held in contempt. Judge Staley clearly found that this woman was wrongfully withholding the children, the child, and she used that as a basis to dismiss this case as well and cited that statute in her order dismissing this case. So the three bases that this case was dismissed upon. The contempt. Ms. Abrams says, I'm sorry, Ms. Kuhn says that they were trying to go to court to get him to visit. Well, the truth of the matter is the contempt was filed before she filed the modification. My client had missed over 100 overnights in a three-month period. That was testified to by Ms. Abrams on the witness stand. My client filed a contempt to be able to see his child. My client filed a contempt because she was taking the child to a therapist that he didn't approve of and didn't know about. My client filed a contempt because she didn't pay the attorney's fees that she had been ordered to pay. My client filed a fourth contempt that he withdrew because it was a matter of an appropriate gesture and it wasn't worth taking the court's time. She unilaterally chose the therapist. She was held in contempt. She did not pay the court-ordered attorney's fees. She was held in contempt. I'd like to address one issue before you sit down. Yes. As to the contempt itself where she was found in contempt but that it was not willful, does that amount to a finding in contempt and then a negation of that finding by saying it was not willful? If you're honest, interpret it that way. My interpretation was that she held her in contempt and she said, I consider it non-willful, but I still consider it contemptuous behavior of the court. If that negates that order, it doesn't affect the outcome because the attorney's fees of $16,000 was certainly justified to defend the modifications that were dismissed to bring the contempts on the other two issues. And the guardian item was necessitated by her withholding the child. That was the second part of that question is whether or not 
any of those attorney fees were based on that supposedly negated contempt? Uh, it's not specified, Your Honor. I think there's, our attorney's fees were certainly more than $16,000 for all of the issues that were raised. The case was filed. There was a temporary hearing in November where she had not, the child had not seen the father. In the middle of that temporary hearing, when I examined the, the mother, I said, so are you going to let him visit? And she goes, well, now I don't mind letting him visit, something to that effect. The, the hearing was stopped. We decided to reach an agreement that we would try to make it work while the case was pending. It didn't work. It was placed back on a calendar and then resumed. So this was a significant bit of litigation. There was a guardian litem. There were depositions taken. There were uh, the guardian litem met with both sides. There was certainly more than $16,000 in fees, but $16,000 was not on the failure to visit. It, it was on depending on the modification. Not visiting would have been a, a one-minute case. She admitted he didn't visit for over 100 nights. And the question would have been, was it willful or not? That was not a, a significant part of the case. Her financial affidavit submitted into evidence because they've made an argument about disparity of income. Her financial affidavit showed assets of $1.2 million. So the argument that there was, this was inappropriate because of the disparity of income, uh, in my opinion, is not an accurate representation of the facts. One other question. As it relates to the contempt and attorney fees, was there any request for a finding of fact and law as to what attorney fees uh, were with regard to what, which contempts? I don't believe there was, and I think that's fatal to their appeal. There was no finding of facts on what it applies to. Yes, I'm, so I'm looking at the attorney fee order that says the amount awarded is attributable only to the modification action where the mother failed to prevail and counts two and three of the contempt action where the mother was found in willful contempt. I, so why do you think that there may have been an attorney fee based on count one of the I, I don't think there was. I think Your Honor is right in that, that I had not remembered that. I yield to Mr. Webster for the balance of my time.